Today, we will learn and reflect on the monastic manual, The Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacus. This remarkable work, which is one of my favorite works, was one of the first manuals instructing monks how to truly love God and truly love their neighbor. This advice is just as valuable to laymen as it is to monks, as we defeat our vices that keep our hearts from God, and as we encourage our virtues that draw our hearts closer to God. We always like to quote from the works we're discussing, uh, particularly this work, as it's a real treasure. And at the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources we used for this video and my blogs that cover the topic. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. The Ladder of Divine Ascent was written in the 10th century by St. John Climacus, and this was about three centuries after Emperor Constantine made Christianity a state religion of the Roman Empire. Uh, John Climacus arrived at St. Catherine's Monastery when he was only 16. Other than that, we know very little about his life. St. Catherine's Monastery is located in the mountains of the Sinai Desert. Tradition holds that St. Catherine's Monastery was built on Mount Horeb, where Moses encountered the burning bush, and where Moses later received the Ten Commandments. Uh, St. Catherine's Monastery is the oldest continually occupied monastery in the world. The buildings of the monastery are surrounded by fortress walls built by Emperor Justinian. They preserve an ancient letter of protection from Muhammad himself guaranteeing their safety. There are horror stories from centuries past of how ignorant monks living at St. Catherine's were using leaves from discarded manuscripts to start their cooking fires, but these days are long past. Today the monastery has an impressive website and they have many modern monks with IT and other technical experience that work at preserving the many valuable manuscripts that they preserve for scholars. The monastery once possessed the Codex Sinaiticus, which was one of the most ancient and most complete biblical transcripts that's now housed in the British Museum. The Library of St. Catharines also preserves many ancient manuscripts and some of the most ancient icons in the world. Many people mistakenly say that we do not know what Jesus looked like, but the Orthodox say we do because this 6th century icon tells us exactly what Christ looks like. This is one of the early icons also of St. Peter and of the Dormition of the Virgin Mary. And we see in this picture one of the icons of the Ladder of Divine Ascent, which showing monks uh, led by St. John Climacus ascending the ladder to Jesus. And as you can see, the demons are pulling down many of the monks as they ascend the ladder. Now, St. John Climacus encountered three forms of monastic life at St. Catherine's. And this is quoting from Callisto's Ware's introduction. Inside the fortress walls, a synobium, or a monastic brotherhood, uh, pursues the common life under the direction of an abbot and scattered through the surrounding desert there were hermits d dedicated to the solitary life and monks following the middle way which is the way that saint john climacus prefers uh, has small groups under the immediate guidance of a spiritual father Callistos Ware in his introduction continues saint john climacus like saint simeon the new theologian and saint gregory palamas in more modern times lays heavy emphasis on the need for personal experience Christianity, as he sees it, is much more than the exterior acceptance of doctrines and rules. No one can be a true Christian at second hand. There must be a personal encounter. In what you know, see, taste, and touch for yourself. Our dear saint refrains from suggesting rules and routines on praying, eating, sleeping, and working, like you see in some of the later uh, monastic rules like the rule of St. Benedict. What matters for him is not physical asceticism, but humility and purity of heart. What he offers is not techniques and formula, but a way of life, not regulations, but a path of initiation. Now, do you have to be a monk or a nun or a priest to be saved? Our saint very quickly answers this question. God belongs to all free beings. He is the life of all, the salvation of all, the faithful and the unfaithful, the just and the unjust, the pious and the impious, passionate and dispassionate, monks and laymen, wise and simple, healthy and sick, young and old. Just as the effusion of light, the sight of the sun, and the changes of the seasons are for all alike, and as Romans says, God shows no partiality. 
exactly how can a layman lead a godly life? Our saint teaches us. And he says, Some people living carelessly in the world have asked me. We have wives and are beset with social cares. So how can we lead the solitary life? I replied to them, Do all the good you can. Do not speak evil of anyone. Do not steal from anyone. Do not lie to anyone. Do not be arrogant to anyone. Do not hate anyone. Do not be absent from the divine services. Be compassionate to the needy. Do not offend anyone. Do not wreck another man's domestic happiness. And be content with what your own wife can give you. If you behave in this way, you will not be far from the kingdom of heaven. Layman can and should read the monastic classics like the Ladder of Divine Ascent because the Christian life is itself a type of monastic calling. But you need to use common sense when applying the advice to your life situation. Some minor allegorizing is needed. For example, you could consider that marriage is a monastic calling. What's the purpose of marriage? The salvation of souls. Because if each spouse loves the other one as themselves, then theirs will be a happy marriage indeed. Another monastic manual has some advice that possibly applies more to a married couple than to the audience it's intended for, for monks. And the wise advice for St. John of the Cross teaches us that we should only allow someone to be a close friend to us if our friendship increases in both of us our love of God and our love for our neighbor. Work, career, and schooling are monastic callings. To get a good job, we spend many years of schooling to learn our trade or profession. If we spend all of our school years partying and not studying, we pay for the lack of attention for the rest of our lives. To keep our job, we need to keep our bosses and customers happy. Even when we know they're wrong, we bite our tongues and endure because we work for them, and they're often right anyway. You know, our job is to serve them. Their job is not to serve us. And if we think otherwise, we'll no longer have a job. Child rearing is also a monastic pursuit. When children are small, they demand your attention, and sometimes they cry and you don't know why. And you, can, you have a choice. You can either spend fun time with your kids when they're very little, playing with them and taking them to the zoo and the park and other fun places, or you can spend time when they grow up as troubled youngsters, when you have to answer to judges and policemen. St. Paul and Timothy exhorts us that mothers are saved through child rearing if they lead a godly life. And we are all saved if we put the needs and desires of others ahead of our own selfishness. Looking ahead to the obedience rung of the ladder, a few steps above, there is some more practical advice that our saint has for monks when they are novices that also apply to laymen when they decide what church they want to attend or that they may need to think about when a new priest or pastor leads their local church. And St. John Climacus teaches us, If we are prudent, we should test our helmsman, which means our pastor or priest, so as to not mistake the sailor for the pilot, a sick man for a doctor, a passionate for a dispassionate man, the sea for a harbor, and so bring about the speedy shipwreck for our soul. But when once we have entered the arenas of piety and obedience, we must no longer judge our good manager in any way at all, even though we may perhaps see him in some slight failings, because he's only human. Otherwise, by sitting in judgment, we shall not profit from our obedience. Now, laymen cannot be closely directed by their priests or pastors, like monks are directed by their spiritual fathers or abbots, because as a practical matter, Laymen usually do not live out their daily lives with their priests or pastors like monks do with their abbots. But laymen need to be comfortable with the spirituality of their priest or pastor because if your pastor or priest tells you a truth that needs to be heard that you do not like, you should still listen. And if they ask you to change your ways in a way you do not like, you should be very reluctant to go against their advice. Of course, this advice is more applicable to those Christians who see confession as a sacrament, whether you're Catholic or Orthodox, uh, because those kind of situations where the priest is going to advise you to do these things that you don't like happens more often in the context of confession. But it can also be applicable when you seek uh, spiritual counseling for your marriage or other life problems. As a matter of fact, this trust for clergy is probably more important than any other factors that you use to choose your church, whether it be convenience or the music ministries or whether you feel spiritually fed, which for most people means whether or not they're entertained during the church services. The first rung is about the climb, ever persisting, ever repenting, ever climbing, as the final paragraph of this first step of the ladder impresses on us. So, who is a faithful and wise monk? 
He who has kept his fervor unabated and to the end of his life has not ceased daily to add fire to fire, fervor to fervor, zeal to zeal, love to love. This is the first step. Let him who has mounted the ladder not turn back. Now living a godly life takes effort and self-discipline. And learning how to live a godly life takes study. And it takes time, for we will either spend our time living a godly life, or we will spend our time living an ungodly life. That is our choice. And note that our saint progresses from fire to fervor to zeal to love. And he teaches us that all who enter upon the good fight, which is hard and close, but also easy, must realize they must leap into the fire if they really expect the celestial fire to dwell in them. Now what does our saint mean exactly? Uh, perhaps that sometimes we need to stand up and do what is right, even when that is unpopular, or correct a slander during a conversation, or perhaps sometimes uh, even risking your job or your life to prevent great injustices. St. John Climacus defines the transgressor as one who holds the law of God after his own depraved fashion. We are reminded of the book of Judges, a book that contains so many puzzling and twisted and horrible stories. That, that book that often laments that in those times in the books of Judges, everyone in Israel did what was right in his own eyes. That reminds me of the often told joke we've all probably heard many times. What's the difference between somebody who goes to church on Sunday and somebody who goes to the beach on Sunday? Uh, the difference is the person who goes to the beach on Sunday doesn't think he needs to go to church because he doesn't need a change. Similarly, the person who goes to church on Sunday doesn't need a change either because he goes to church, which is the real world. We like spirituality, we like the beach, church is okay. We might even read the Bible occasionally on our own terms, as long as the church doesn't try and tell us what to do. Now, God's not that much of a problem because often we can imagine him to say whatever truths we want him to say. But the church, with all these preachers preaching away, that can be a real problem. So they might want to tell us things that we don't want to hear. This admonition by our saint applies to all, including laymen. Let no one, by appealing to the weight and multitude of his sin, say that he is unworthy of the monastic vow, and for love of pleasure disparage himself, excusing himself with excuses in his sins. Where there is much corruption, considerable treatment is needed to draw out all the impurities. The healthy need not go to a hospital. St. John Climacus observes that in the very beginning of our renunciation of the world, it is certainly with labor and grief that we practice the virtues. And those who at once, from the very outset, follow the virtues and fulfill the commandments with joy and, and alacrity, or enthusiasm, certainly deserve praise. And in the same way, those who spend a long time in asceticism and still find it a weariness to obey the commandments, if they obey them at all, certainly deserves pity. Now what a wonderful prayer that would be, that we would ask of God that we lead a godly life with joy, eager to follow the virtues. Which reminds me of the passage by St. Maximus the Confessor, that when we love our neighbor, we should be also eager to forgive his sins, just as Christ is eager to forgive our sins. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. The two editions of the Ladder of Divine Ascent appear to use the same translation. Uh, we recommend that you purchase them both, however. The version, the classics of Western spirituality, includes about 70 pages of preface and an introduction by Callistus Ware, who is one of the editors and translators of the Greek Philokalia into English. But the Holy Transfiguration Monastery edition uh, has both an introduction plus a sermon and several ancient letters, and it has paragraph numbers, which are missing from the Classics edition. So we will be referring to Callisto's Ware's introduction as we progress up the ladder. The Ladder of Divine Ascent is as easy to read as the Philokalia and the Stoic Philosophers. They're all very accessible. The many pithy sayings by St. John Climacus are so clear that sometimes I wonder why I even want to comment on them at all. Perhaps I should just quote them without commentary. The Ladder of Divine Ascent was not included in the Greek Philokalia or its English translation because it was so readily available. About three dozen manuscripts survive, which is remarkable for such an ancient text, which means we can be certain we have the complete text. Now, McGuckin devotes a few pages to St. John Climacus and his Ladder of Divine Ascent, placing it in context in the monastic tradition and in the reaction against the excesses of Origen's philosophical system. 
uh, the YouTube description, links to the video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking the like and subscribe button and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.